everyone here. Uh, if you would open your Bibles, please, to the book of Habakkuk. If you aren't sure where it is, it's between the much more popular books of Nahum and Zephaniah. That's helpful. Um, actually, if you, if, you actually, if you find Matthew, you turn back about 20 pages or so, depending on your Bible, and, and you should be very close to Habakkuk. So if you turn back 20 pages and you're at Zephaniah, you still keep going. If you turn back 20 pages, you're at Nahum, go back a little bit further. I mean, uh, go back the other way. Um, so that's where Habakkuk is. And Habakkuk, uh, today is the introduction of Habakkuk. Um, and Habakkuk is one of the minor prophets in the Old Testament. Um, but this book is actually different than uh, almost all the other books of prophecy in Scripture. Um, typically, uh, what do prophets do, right? Since we got kids in here, what do prophets typically do? They, they speak, who do they normally speak to? Okay, this may not work. <laughs> they speak to God's people on behalf of God, right? Normally a book of prophecy is typically the prophets are calling out the sin. But Habakkuk is different because it, it actually, Habakkuk never addresses God's people directly. Habakkuk is a story, or I mean, a recounting of Habakkuk as a prophet, his conversation, if you will, with God. Um, so, so normally, a prophet calls to repentance. This is where this prophet is struggling with, with what he sees in the world and, and wants to kind of, he actually has complaints uh, to God. And, um, and so it's, it's different in that way. Uh, this also, uh, this, the, the outcome of that conversation is, is kind of, we're clued into that as well. Um, and, and in some ways, it's kind of like a, a little bit of a microcosm of, of which I think every generation probably in some respect or another has, a, a generation of believers has the same type of conversation with God. Um, so it's one of those things where it's a, it's a timeless book in a sense because uh, there's specific things that he talks about, but in, in a sense, we can all relate to the things that he's saying, and, and I think it's incredibly timely in our day and age. Um, so little is known about Habakkuk as a person, and he's, he's mentioned as the, the author. Um, in fact, one commentator, or commentator I read <laughs> stated that he is the least known prophet in the Old Testament. Um, there's some speculation of who he was. Maybe he... Uh, uh, help Daniel uh, at one point, but not much is explicitly told to us in Scripture. The, the kind of the explanation of who he is is, is extra biblical, so we're not really sure of who he is. The date of this book was, that was written also is not clear. Um, you know, like if we did Judges, it was kind of like right in line. The judge, book of Judges started with, you know, right after those things happened. So we could actually kind of work back through history and find the, pretty much the precise date. Um, but the book uh, predicts the Babylonian invasion of Judah, which is like um, between 598 around B.C., 587 to 598 B.C. Um, so this is still, um, so this book is written before that, but we don't know how far before it. Um, but it's still more than 400 years or so before Christ. Um, so if we were living at the time uh, of the birth of Christ, so just kind of give you a context of, of where this book is written in the framework of what we kind of are comfortable with in history. So if you think about the birth of Christ, most of us are familiar with that, right, Christmas. Um, this happened more than 400 years before that. So um, if we were living at the time of Christ, or if the time of Christ was now, think about this. This happened before Jamestown was settled. This happened before the United States of America existed. This is going on. Um, and at that time, Europe was the center of the world, was the world power. So all the things that were going on in the 15, 1600s, like that's, that's how far removed this is from the birth of Christ, which is just in some ways a, uh, something to think about, comfort, um, and, and thinking about God and seeing uh, all of time, uh, not as we do. And this book, I said, as I said, is, is not addressing the people of Judah. It's a, it's a record of a conversa conversation, if you will, between God and his prophet. And it consists of the kind of the flow of the book. There's, there's two complaints against God, and God gives two responses to Habakkuk. And then this, the book ends with, uh, with, with Habakkuk he having, having a changed heart and trusting in the goodness and sovereignty of God. So it's almost, like I said, it, it's a microcosm of, of what probably all of us have gone through at some point, where we see things around us, 
And we're, we cry out to God and we kind of want God to do things in our way and in our timetable. God responds through our circumstances or through reading his word, understanding who he is and, and how he acts in time. And then over the course of time, our heart is changed to, to trust in God's sovereignty even more. All right, so Habakkuk uh, has been looking around. He's been seeing the evil that's taking place within the people of God, how they've forsaken the law and become violent, right? We know that this, this pattern occurs over and over again in the Old Testament. And, and, you know, God's people were in covenant with God, right? He, you know, he made a covenant with Abraham, and then, you know, they fell away. They continued to fall away, and God sends prophets, right? And then they kill the prophets, right? And then they finally send Jesus. We kind of know, if you know the, the history of salvation, you can see how this plays out. They have neglected justice, and the righteous are surrounded by the wicked. We'll see that in the first few verses. And he's apparently, you know, based on what he's saying, he's been crying out to God to save them from their sin for some time. He's, he's not a man who's, who's just coming to see. He, he seems like, you know, based on, he's someone who cries out to God, and he's been pleading with God, and he's almost to the point where he's, he's frustrated God, I've been praying to you. I've been crying out to you. Why haven't you answered me the way that I want you to? Right? So then God answers and says that he is working in Habakkuk's days, even though Habakkuk doesn't see it. He says he's raising up the Chaldeans, or as we know them, Babylon, to discipline and judge God's people and save them. Right? So that's the first complaint, and that's God's first response. And then this prompts the second complaint against God. Right? So he's, he's astonished that God would use an even more wicked people to bring judgment against his own people. God then answers uh, with, with five woes against his people and against Babylon. And in that, he makes the statement that the righteous will live by faith in the promises of God. That's different than living by experience. In his woes, he calls out the unjust economics, the slave labor irresponsible leaders, and idolatry of Babylon. These practices are not unique to them, though. In some ways, all nations will eventually become like them. Left to their own devices, all nations will become like Babylon. So the promise of God rings true through all generations. This leads Habakkuk to write a prayer in the form of a poem restating and reaffirming his trust in God's sovereignty and goodness to his people. He models what it means to live by faith when he pens the words, Though the fig tree should not blossom nor the fruit of the, on the vines, the produce of the olive fail and the, yields, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the folding, there be no herd in, from there, there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord I will take joy in the God of my salvation. So that's kind of just a really quick summary of what's happening here. And so what, what we're going to do this morning is, is a way of preparing to study this book. We don't often do this, but it's a short enough book that we can, um, is I'm going to read the whole thing. Uh, just now I'm going to read the whole thing together so that you get a feel for the book as a whole. And then I'm going to address some things. We're not going to get into the text specifically today, but I want to point out things that we're going to see through this book over the next few weeks. And they're kind of uh, challenges. There's, there's going to be, in this, in this process of this, reading this book, I, I, I think I would wager, if I, if I did wager, I don't wager, but um, that all of us, if we don't, we should get our toes stepped on in this book. Because if we're honest with ourselves, we've said the same things to God that Habakkuk is saying to God. And so... Uh, we need to go through the process of, of wrestling with this truth, wrestling with our own emotions and our own frustrations before God so that we can too, with Habakkuk, cry out, yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon the people who invade us, though the fig tree, and then, sorry, God, the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on high places that's what our goal should be. So if we're, if we're honest, if we're, if we're really kind of allowing ourselves to feel what he feels and walk through what he walk throughs, walks through, we should get our toes stepped on in some places, and we should, Lord willing, come through with an understanding of God's sovereignty over all things and trust 
in that sovereignty. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the whole book. It shouldn't take long. Uh, and, then, and then just point out those things that we're going to learn as we walk through this. Habakkuk 1. Hope, have I given you guys enough time to find it? <laughs> all right. I, it's funny because I, I, I use my apps all the time when I'm, a lot, when I'm studying and preparing. I don't, I don't always, like sometimes I will use my, my paper Bible, um, but I, I'm often on my iPad or my phone. And so when I actually had to go find it, the first time I was like, wait, whoa, whoa. anyway, so you're not alone. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so the justice goes forth perverted. This is the Lord's answer to Habakkuk. Look among the nations and see. Wonder and be astounded. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if I told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize the dwellings not of their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle swift to devour. They all come for violence all their faces forward. They gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff, and at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress, for they pile up earth and take it. Then they sweep like the wind and go on. Guilty men whose own might is their God. So Habakkuk's second complaint. Are you not from everlasting O Lord, my God, my Holy One, we shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them for your reproof. Who are you? Uh, you You who are purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong. Why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? You make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. He brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet. So he rejoices and is glad. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net and makes offerings in his dragnet. For by them, he lives in luxury and his his food is rich. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. Moreover, wine is a traitor, an arrogant man who is never at rest. His greed is as wide as Sheol. Like death, he is never enough. He gathers for himself all nations and collects as his own all peoples." Shall not all these take up their taunt against him with scoffing and riddles for him and say, Woe to him who heaps up what, it, what is not his own for how long and loads himself with pledges? Will not your debtors suddenly arise and those who will awake who will make you tremble? Then you will be spoil for them because you've plundered many nations. All the remnant of the people shall plunder you for the blood of man and violence to the earth, to cities and to all who dwell in them. Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house to set his nest on high, 
to be safe from the reach of harm. You have devised shame for your house by cutting off many peoples. You have forfeited your life. For the stone will cry out on the, from the wall and the beam from the woodwork respond. Woe to him who builds a town with blood and founds a city on iniquity. Behold, it is not from the Lord of hosts that peoples labor merely for fire and nations weary themselves for nothing. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as waters cover the sea. Woe to him who makes his neighbors drink to pour out your wrath and to make them drunk in order to gaze at their nakedness. You will have your fill of shame instead of glory. Drink yourself and show your uncircumcision. The cup in the Lord's right hand will come around to you and utter shame will come upon your glory. The violence done to Lebanon will overwhelm you as will the destruction of the, breast, the beasts that terrified them. For the blood of man and violence to the earth, to cities and all who dwell in them. What profit is an idol when its maker has shaped it, a metal image, a teacher of lies? For its maker trusts in its own creation when he makes speechless idols. Woe to him who says to a wooden thing, awake, to a silent stone, arise. Can this teach? Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in it. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. That's God's response. Here's the prayer of Habakkuk the prophet according to Shigigoth. O Lord, I have heard the report of you in your work. O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendor covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light. Rays flashed from his hand and there he veiled, and there he veiled his power. Before him went pestilence and plague followed at his heels. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations. Then the eternal mountains were scattered. The everlasting hills sank low. His were the everlasting ways. I saw the tents of Cushan in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was your anger against the rivers or your indignation against the sea when you rode on your horses on your chariot of salvation? You stripped the sheath from your bow, calling for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. The raging water swept on. to give The deep gave forth its voice. It lifted its hands on high. The sun and moon stood in their place. At the light of your arrows they, as they sped. At the flash of your glittering spear. You marched through the earth in fury. You threshed the nations in anger. You went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. You pierced with his own arrows the heads of his warriors, who came like a whirlwind to scatter me, rejoicing as if to devour the poor in secret. You trampled the sea with your horses, the surging of mighty waters, I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. Yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon the people who invade us. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor the fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on high places. For the choir master with stringed instruments. Let's pray. Ask God to help us understand this text as we move through this book. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, even just the 
even in just reading that again, just seeing the, the mighty hand of our salvation. Lord, that you are our, the one who seeks after your own people. You are the one who will, who will crush those who oppose you. Lord, you are the one who will bring righteousness and bring justice to those who are downcast, to those who have been oppressed. You are the one God of all the earth. Lord, the things that we create, that we give our time to, the idols of our hearts are of nothing. You are the one true God. Lord, I pray that as we go through this book over the next several weeks that you would just move within our hearts, help us to understand it, to apply it to our own context today, and to, to learn and grow from it. Lord, do a mighty work in us and through us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So now, now that we have, we kind of have a feel and a flow for the setting and, the, and kind of the way that this book plays out, right? So you saw that you see the, the different things, the complaint, response, complaint, response, and then and then future response, trust in God. I want to give some things that we should think about and just to kind of be aware of and, and to expect as we study this book. We are going to see uh, a lot of parallels for, to our own day and to the Chaldeans, right? We're just going to put that out there. Our, our own day, we could look around and we could be saying like Habakkuk, how long, Lord, shall I cry for help and you not hear? How long, some of you will say, how long have we been crying for the violence done against unborn children to stop? How long have we been crying for injustice to be avenged? How long, Lord, have we been crying for those who have forsaken the law to return to you? How long, Lord, do, as we look around, we see violence. As we look around, we see iniquity. We see destruction. We see strife and contention. We see a lack of justice. We see a lack of true leaning on the word of God. Some of us will have those and have prayed those prayers and may feel like that. So we, we need to, to, as much as we can, put ourselves in that position to look around and see that this is not just some old story that, that we're just going to read about. This is happening in our day you notice that the point of the book is not actually, um, the point of him answering his questions is not actually uh, coming and doing it right away. It's, it's working on Habakkuk's heart more than anything. So we need to be willing for our hearts to be worked on. And so there's some warnings that I want us to, to look at um, as we study this book. And, and as I said before, this will uh, step on our toes a little bit, but that's good especially if it's God's word stepping on your toes. I don't, I don't personally ever want to step on somebody's toes. I want the word of God to step on all of our toes, right? If that comes through me, then so be it. But my prayer is that it's the Holy Spirit through the word of God. So here's the, just kind of a list. There's, there's six things that I, I want to just say are going to um, challenge. All right, so the first thing is, and, and you know, these are kind of, some are simple, some are not. Um, this book is going to challenge your understanding of God's timing, right? So, so if you look at verse one, I'm sorry, verse two, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear, right? Our, our view of timing in our day and age, we, we want something right away. We want it yesterday. I, I mean, I'm kind of amazed. Um, I won't mention a name so that you won't know I'm talking about him. But we have, our, just in, in the 18 or however many years, what's the difference between, how old were you when, when our youngest was born? 12. In the 12 years <laughs> since Micah to our youngest, uh, this whole thing of uh, Amazon, had, like when the kids were growing up, the young, older kids, it was like, can we get that? It's like, no, we can't get that. We have to go to the store, blah, blah, blah. Now it's like, Dad, can you order that on Amazon right now? Like, this is a regular occurrence, right? I would like this. Can you order it right now? 
Like we want things, and if we order it, we're like expecting next day delivery. Right? We, we, don't have, we don't have the patience like we used to. We don't have the, the long view of things like we used to um, in our day. One of the things, this is an aside, one of the things, the, the, the message that I believe God kind of had me learn as I became a pastor nine years ago here at this church uh, through reading biog- or listening to biographies of, of people who, you know, from the 15, 16, 1700s, uh, the biggest lesson that I learned was take the long view in ministry. Take the long view. We are not a people who are, who are accustomed to taking the long view in anything. And if we do take a long view, it's like five years. But, but I was encouraged through, through the things I learned and even meeting through other pastors. The long view is decades, not months or years. A long view is a long time, right? So if you look at how things have like even just look at our family here at this church, like how, how over the course of nine years, it's, it's changes seem to come slowly, but if you look back over the time, like God's done a work here. And there's, there might have been days where, where things were challenging or things were like, it was like, God, if, I, if, I can't, if this doesn't happen now, I, you know, I, don't, I don't know if I'll make it or whatever. Some of y'all might have said that. But when you take the long view and you understand that God's timing is different than ours, so that's going to be challenging for us as we go through this book. The second thing that this will challenge is it will challenge your view of God's sovereignty over evil. Right? Oftentimes, and, and I don't hear this so much in here, but I hear it kind of in the world. People, people tend to, uh, in even Christian circles, they tend to make it sound like there's, there's this good and evil fight that's going on in our world and we have to win, and the only, like, it's almost as if it's unsure of the victory. Anybody heard people talk like that? Well, well, we've it really, we, we've got to do this, and we've got to do that, and if we're, if we're going to do this, if we're going to, you know, if we're going to take back America for God, we got to do this, right? Well, here's, here's the thing that we learn from this book. If you look at verse 6, behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans. Right, so God says, I am raising up the Chaldeans. And then he describes them, that bitter and nasty nation. Right, so, so here's the thing that we need to understand, and this is, we're, we're going to get into it, but I want to just let you know it's coming. God used the Chaldeans, and he said, I'm going to use these people. I am raising up. Do you think if God raises somebody up, there's anything that we can do to knock them down? If, if God is raising up a people, the bitter and nasty people, for the purpose of rebuking his own people, there is nothing on earth that we can do to topple that. God is sovereign over the bitter and nasty nations of the world. And he will use them to confront, and rebuke, and discipline his children. So, so we need to, to wrestle with that. And think about that and, 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 and really kind of weigh that. And it's going to challenge, be challenged. If, you're, if your view is of this uncertain battle of good and evil, that's, that's going to be questioned. That's going to be called into question. So that's the second thing. It will challenge your view of God's sovereignty over evil. Another point on that one, actually, if you look at Pharaoh, that's an easy one. Pharaoh and Exodus. What did, Pharaoh, what did God say about Pharaoh? I raised him up. For my purpose. What did he say when, when Moses went to Pharaoh? Who hardened his heart? God hardened his heart. God was the one who was doing that work. He was sovereign over Pharaoh's heart. The third thing that's going to challenge you in this is going to challenge your view of prayer. Right? So, so we see in this narrative, in this, is Habakkuk coming to God with a prayer, with a prayer request. God, I've seen these things, and I want you to act now. How long shall I cry for help, and you will not hear? Do you hear, do you hear the, like, like the little entitled brat that Habakkuk is in that sense? How long? I'm going to cry, and you're not going to hear? You're not listening to me, God. You're, you're not paying attention to what I'm telling you. I'm pointing out things that you clearly cannot see, 
So do something about this now, God. Right? And what's his answer? Look among the nations and see, wonder and be astounded, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if I told. God's answer to Habakkuk's little bratty cry is like, hey, dude, I'm at work. You don't see it, but I'm at work. I've got things going on. You're not even going to believe it if I told you what it was. All right, the second way that we, your view of prayer will be challenged is this. Uh, prayer is not a means of, of manipulating God to do something that you want to do. Prayer, prayer is not about us informing God of the things that he can't see. He's clearly too busy for that, right? Prayer is, is about us coming to God and, and laying our desires at his feet, letting our requests be made known to him, and the what of God which transcends all understanding will guard our hearts and minds. The peace of God which transcends all understanding. Make your requests known to God, and the result is the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds. Prayer is as much about changing your heart as it is about, it's more so about changing your own heart. God works through prayer. And that's, this is kind of one of those mysterious things. God calls us to pray. He instructs us to pray. He works through our prayers, but it is not a means for us to manipulate God. So that we see that at the end of this book, Habakkuk's heart is changed and says, no matter what's going on, I will trust you. The fourth thing that we will be challenged by in this book, it will challenge your view of nations. Right? We are a part of a nation as Christians, right? What is the nation that we're a part of? The body of Christ. Do you know the difference between, and now no, we'll get into this. I know it's Memorial Day. We're thankful for all, or tomorrow is, thankful for the men and women who have given their lives for the country that we live in, the nation state in which we reside. I'm thankful for the freedoms that I had. A friend of, friend of ours, actually the guy who cut the tree down, uh, his son swore into the Coast Guard right after graduation on Friday. So proud of him. So proud that I know him. You know, the, just the, the ability that we have in this nation that we live in to experience freedoms, right? That's something that we cherish. It's something that we value. But this is not our nation, You know, there's a difference, I remember this from political science, there's a difference between a nation and a nation state, right? Everybody know this? The, the, there, a nation is a group of people who have a common culture, practices, language, um, and, and those people are together. So when Israel is walking through the wilderness, they are a nation, right? But they're not a nation state. A nation state is one of those groups who also has land. Everybody, did everybody know that? Maybe the fifth, I mean, maybe I'm smarter than a fifth grader, I don't know, but, but that's a, there's something that's different about a nation and a nation state. We are a nation of Christians that lives within the nation state of the United States of America. Our first allegiance is not to this nation state. Our first allegiance is to Christ and to his body. That's the nation. So, so this book will challenge our view of nations. And as I said before, every Every nation will eventually, every secular nation will eventually turn into Babylon, and we see that happening in our day. And that's going to be challenged. The fifth thing that this book will challenge is the way that you view comfort. You know, we, we have, and especially in, in my lifetime, I, I've lived up without, lived, grown up without knowing um, as, as much as the generations before, what it's like to have uh, war. We, the wars that were, have been fought since I've, been, uh, since I've grown up have been wars that really haven't cost me anything personally, right? Like, we never had rationing, you know, Desert Storm, Afghanistan, all those things. We never had to ration. We never had to do, you know, we didn't have Uncle Sam on the corner, I want you. We didn't have people just being drafted, Right, the things that happened in Vietnam, World War II, World War One, 
Right? So, so our view of comfort, in, in especially my generation and especially the generations after, is very different than even a generation or two behind us. And it's not to say that, that, that we're more sinful or whatever, but, but we just don't know what it's like to be discomforted. Right? The, the worst thing that we've had to do in the past year, which I'm not saying is that easy, but is, is we've been inconvenienced this year. Right? I, I, I mean, I know people, people in here lost work. They lost finances and things like that. People I know. But even, even this past year, is, is, it, you know, I'm going to be careful, pales in comparison to some things that were happening, the Great Depression, right? Things like that. So we don't, we don't our, our comfort typically is something that we, we assume as this is just God's blessing on us as his people and it's easy to, to be lulled into a false sense of security that our comfort is just is something that we get with God. We don't, we, none of us would claim to believe the prosperity gospel, but some of us functionally believe the prosperity gospel. And you usually know it when something gets taken away, right? When you go, but, but what did I do to deserve this? Anybody ever ask that? I mean, if we're honest, I think we all have, like, lost a job or whatever. What did I do to deserve this? That thinking is a prosperity gospel thinking but here, Habakkuk is going to teach us and challenge our view of comfort. He says in, in chapter 3, verse 16 and 19, I'll just read it again. We've already read it twice. I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. This is him reconciling himself to God's timing in his judgment. Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me, yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon the people who invade us. Though the, trig, though the fig tree should not blossom, nor the fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. All comfort gone. Future hope of food, right? So every, every avenue of sustenance has been cut off, yet... I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. And he makes me tread on high places. Our comfort, the way that we view it, will be challenged as we walk through this book. And finally, this is my hope and prayer, and I believe that the message of Scripture would line up, is that this book will challenge you to treasure Jesus more. As with every scripture from back, front, front to back cover, it's written to magnify the name of Jesus. The, the, the imagery, especially in, in chapter 3, of, there's imagery of the Exodus, and, and it's kind of meant to, it's, it's, it, as happens oftentimes between the original Exodus and Christ, Things are always pointed back to Exodus. God is always reminding his people, am I not the God who saved you out of Egypt? Am I not the God who, who, who ransomed you from Egypt? And he's, that's always kind of a point back so that we can look forward. God uses that time and time again, and he uses it here. And he's telling his people, be reminded of how I saved you from the Egyptians and know that I will save you in the future. You went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. That's a reference to Christ. Understanding, when we understand and put all those pieces together, our understanding of God's timing, our understanding of God's view uh, of sovereignty over evil, our understanding of prayer, our understanding of who we are as a nation, the way that we view comfort, all of those things, if you take away all of those things in, in kind of a culmination, what that should do, what that should lead us to is a recognition of, of how, how important and how powerful and how amazing the treasure of knowing Christ is. When, when everything is stripped away, when all things are gone, we can cry out with the prophet Habakkuk. I think about the book of Lamentations and Lamentations 3, where he says, this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. God is, his, the faithfulness of God, I can't remember the exact wording, 
right? Anybody can help me out? The steadfast love of the Lord never, never fails. Yes. That, that, there's the, and and if, you, if you even look at that Lamentations 3, um, and the, the writer, the author, goes through this whole, read Lamentations 3. If you, this, that one parallels this almost, not exactly, but he goes through all these things where, and he says, God did, he did this, you did this to me. You made my teeth grind on gravel, right? Like there's this, I remember the wormwood and the gall. He's talking about just intense suffering. And this is talking about a time when people were boiling and eating their children for food. I probably shouldn't have said that with the kids in here. But he is, he is talking about utter suffering. And then he says, therefore I call to mine and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies are new Every morning. Great is your faithfulness. If we can walk through and, and wrestle with our understanding of God's timing, our understanding of his sovereignty over evil, our understanding of prayer and the way that it works in our minds, the way that we see comfort, if, if we're wrestling with those things and allowing God to do work in our hearts, what that will result in is us treasuring Christ more. Because we get him. The cross doesn't promise us his, that he'll, the answer is in the moment that we ask. It doesn't promise us that he will remove us from all evil situations. It doesn't promise us that um, the things that we pray for are going to happen right away. It doesn't promise us a safety and security and comfort. It doesn't promise us any of those things. It promises us Jesus. It promises us a relationship that can never be broken, never be taken away, and never be destroyed by anyone on earth. That's what we have to look forward to in this book, and I am looking forward to digging in to it with you over the next several weeks. So let's pray and ask God to help us and, uh, and worship him some. Heavenly Father, I thank you again for your word. I thank you for the way that you have um, given us this book. And Lord, just even, even more excited to go through it now that I've preached this introduction, Lord. Just seeing so many things that you have to speak to us. I pray that you would help us. Lord, prepare our hearts, prepare our minds. And uh, Lord, just give us grace as we walk through it grace to understand, grace to apply. And Lord, let us, let us be changed by your word through this study. I pray that in all of these things that we would treasure Christ above all else, the one who, who was there at creation, the one who holds the world together with the word of his power, the one who put on flesh and went to be killed and murdered on the cross. And that very one who rose again to secure our justification, to bring us the promise of hope and life everlasting. Lord, we thank you for that. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.